Okay. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Um, so the, my title slide is uh, a bucket of tools that uh, is high up on the scaffolding um, that's on the exterior of Canterbury Cathedral uh, by the northwest transept, which is being totally reconstructed right now by uh, stonemasons. And uh, I was up there with... Um, Anyway, we're, I was up on the scaffolding with um, uh, a bunch of curators and art historians like me, and this bucket really struck me uh, as um, an, a kind of beautiful thing, kind of worn with lots of use um, uh, by the hands of the masons who are carving the stones to go in this great building, <laughs> in this window. It seemed to me quite an eloquent metaphor, really, of what's going on on that building and also what's going on um, at least in my professional life right now, uh, which is a collaboration of uh, highly skilled people across a very, very wide range of disciplines. In order to rebuild that window at Canterbury Cathedral, for example, there are craftspeople, st highly trained stonemasons who begin learning the craft of limestone carving from the age of about 16 or 17. Um, there are engineers, structural engineers, who um, uh, work out the uh, compressive and tensile strengths of the stones. There are archaeologists who, who have to interpret why the window fell down in the first place. Um, and then there are art historians like me who are very concerned with the architectural history and the fabric of the building. And all of us come together on the scaffolding by a bucket like this one in order to try to keep a building like that standing up and interpretable to the public. So hence my um, opening slide. And I was um, kind of tantalized, really, by the invitation to speak to the title Collaborative Humanities because it's not a term that I am familiar with in the way that I am, say, digital humanities. And I tried to test out my lack of familiarity with it as a concept by um, entering it into the British Library's catalogue. Now, if you type in digital humanities into the BL catalogue, you'll come up with about 100 book titles. That's not including article titles. If you added journal articles and, um, and, uh, and, and even journal titles, you'd get a much higher number than that even. So there's about 100 published books. And that's in a fairly, re that has a very recent history. I mean, I think we're talking really the past 10 years or so that books in uh, about the digital humanities, questioning them, defining them, uh, have been published. If you do the same experiment with collaborative humanities, you'll come up with no book titles. In fact, um, you will come up with uh, one journal article, which I uh, didn't actually go and read, uh, so, um, which is one of those blurted confessions that I hadn't intended to make, but there you go. So I was thinking about why this was. Why don't we talk about collaborative humanities as a concept? Because it seems like quite a good one to describe what we're doing. Oh, and the formatting of my slides. Oh, so, <laughs> and one of the reasons for that, I, I put a, I basically the clever thing I've done with this slide is I've added a question mark, collaborative humanities, because I think for most of us doing humanities research, we uh, are still very wedded to the lone scholar model. And I'm showing you here the National Gallery's um, iconic um, Messina image of St. Jerome in his study. And in fact, you could do quite an interesting iconographic survey of the lone scholar in their study. Back to Canterbury Cathedral, in the Lady Chapel, there's a wonderful um, monument to a scholar who sits in a study constructed entirely of books uh, carved out of stone, um, having a private moment, solitary moment of inspiration. And I think, you know, one of the things about the humanities, and one of the reasons why humanities scholars are quite inexpensive, is because what we want more than anything, usually, is to go to a library, maybe floor two of the Warburg Institute, or rare books at the British Library, or the IHR, and just be left alone. It's very inexpensive compared to running a lab, or, um, or <laughs> indeed reconstructing the south northwest transept of Canterbury Cathedral. So we want to be like Jerome. Um, and yet, at the same time, the humanities have always been collaborative. Um, before, in fact, even the notion of humanities was really a way of describing the enterprise uh, in which we're all engaged through, I don't know, stories that you might be familiar with from uh, teaching at the School of Athens in antiquity. Uh, uh, humanities, research, philosophy, natural science, and so forth, all involved 
um, a process of people coming together in a physical space, sharing their knowledge, and especially engaging in processes of dialectic and debate, very much of the kind that the first two presentations this morning were engaged with as a kind of online phenomenon. Uh, so in that sense, the humanities are always collaborative because we come together like this and work together. Um, they've also always been collaborative in that people share large tasks. A big task is divided among a number of individuals, and that um, has always been the case as well. And one might think, for example, of movements like the Great Translation Movement um, in the, um, before about the year 1000, when Arab scholars translated vast numbers of texts from Latin and Greek into the Arabic language. You might see that as a kind of mass collaboration, a kind of mass digitization equivalent, if you like, uh, that movement. The other way in which I think the humanities have always been uh, collaborative and remain importantly so is the place that intellectual friendship has in them. And I think perhaps one of the most striking examples of that that I can pull out of a hat is the friendship that was struck up between the great humanist scholars, foundational humanist scholars, in fact, Boccaccio and Petrarch, who corresponded with one another, the elder offering advice and support to the younger through letters, the younger inspired by the elder's work. And I think that form of epistolary friendship is uh, critically important. There's one other form of um, collaborative humanities that I'm very struck by, and I think this image of Jerome isn't a bad uh, way of evoking it. And that is the phenomenon, not just of synchronic collaboration, we're all alive at the same moment, and here we are in this room together, uh, working together, sharing our ideas, or whatever. Um, we also collaborate diachronically. So, for example, Jerome translates the Bible into the Latin language from all of the many languages in which he found it, Hebrew, Greek, and so forth. Um, now, the entire Latin Vulgate is digitized, um, but it's only digitized because um, editors took Jerome's text, uh, copied it after it had been copied zillions of times um, in a countless number of forms throughout the Middle Ages, edited it, turned it into a printed book, and that printed text eventually becomes a digital one, which we now work on all the time. And so in that sense, we collaborate across time. And the, one of the great kind of cliches <laughs> about that, um, that kind of collaboration is the medieval uh, philosopher, theologian Bernard of Chart, who um, not only came up with a great slogan for this, but also for one of the late Oasis album titles, uh, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. That's how Bernard saw his activity. And in some ways, I think that's how a lot of us do as well. And I was thinking about this um, during Gary's talk, you know, this idea that we're still engaging with Foucault, Deleuze, they're still kind of powering the way that we think about things. And in, in many ways, maybe that's part of this kind of um, diachronic uh, process of collaboration as well. Now, there are, though, um, other drivers for collaboration that I think call, maybe not for this sort of sentimental reverie that I've presented so far, but also for critique. And my slides have animated in the wrong way that this white box is supposed to appear alongside the next thing that's going to come up, which is uh, not here. There it is. You're just going to see the whole slide at once. Animation sequence destroyed. Okay, just ignore this. We're ignoring this, okay? So... In the humanities, we're under a lot of pressure now to collaborate. Um, we're encouraged to do so by funding councils, the AHRC uh, being the main one that funds humanities research, but also ESRC, which funds a lot of work in the humanities and social sciences, uh, and other councils too, the Leverhulme Trust being a major funders, funder for humanities scholars. And um, I think it's worth thinking about what is driving that push for us to collaborate. And I think this graph explains part of what's going on here, which is to say that the AHRC gets about 50 million pounds. That's its budget. There are six other research councils, everything from biosciences to the Medical Research Council, um, ESRC. If you aggregate their budgets together, they are more than a billion pounds. The reason why funders, government policymakers, think that we should behave according to the collaborative models that prevail in science subjects is because economically we barely exist. 
right? They think about, they think, they're thinking about this. This, this saves lives, this column. I mean, this one gives people a reason to live. But this one <laughs> saves lives. It cures cancer. It saves the environment, right? So that, I think, is one of the pressures that we have to face. And they want us to collaborate like the scientists do, even though we want to be like Jerome in our study, maybe with our pet lion um, and a peacock for company <laughs> like Jerome. So that's one phenomenon. Now, what do we do about that? I, to be honest with you, have no idea. We just need to take the argument to the man over and over again. And there are loads and loads of studies that are going on, in fact, that the AHRC itself sponsors that are all about trying to come up with methodologies to, val to measure the value of the humanities, w you know, to measure them economically and also to measure uh, things that are harder to, to put price tags on, their qualitative value. Um, during the reign of the last Labour government, Gordon Brown um, made a speech in the House of Commons in which he suggested that um, the culture sector, the culture industry, uh, is worth about 10% of GDP. Um, now, you see, the problem with this is that um, it's kind of pretend math, you know. How do you actually stand up those figures? Well, the AHRC is really trying valiantly, but while they're doing that, they want us to try to come up with projects that will help us tap into the green column. They want us to work with our colleagues in other uh, reaches of human inquiry. So that's one phenomenon. The other is that the, all of this money taken together uh, is shared among a very small, in fact an increasingly small, if that's not a paradoxical formulation, number of higher education institutions. So there are in the UK, depends on how you count, but about 162 higher education institutions. 32 of them get this money, right? They get 75% of the Research Council funding. And if you want to read the detail of that, the Universities UK published a very interesting report uh, over the summer about it. The remaining 127 share between them the remaining 25%, very unevenly. A lot of the remaining institutions get nothing, um, and it, it tapers off very quickly. And I think following the, um, the uh, outcome of REF 2014, which comes in December, I think that we'll find that that concentration gets even more. Now, from my point of view, this means that we have a kind of moral obligation to collaborate. Uh, people in this part of the exploded pie diagram need to collaborate with the people in this part, or else this will get smaller and smaller and wither away. So we have, I think, to, we have to look out for each other across this pie diagram. And I think that's a, a reason to collaborate. Oh, it pains me, ugly slides with <laughs> misaligned text. You have no idea. It's a little problem area of mine. Mm. Anyway, I'm not going to stop the presentation and make the green square bigger so that it fits the text. So one of the things that the AHRC has done um, uh, as a matter uh, of active policy is, uh, is in terms of the way that we train humanists, uh, which is to say that it says now we're not going to fund PhD students directly, we're going to give lumps of money to collectives of institutions and then they're going to fund them themselves. Um, and the University of Kent is part of one of the doctoral training uh, partnerships which was fortunate to be very handsomely funded through this process. And what I'm going to do with uh, the remaining part of my time is uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing, really almost on an experimental basis, to see whether we can take the, um, take the cloud uh, away and focus instead on the silver lining. Because I think one of the major risks that we face now in terms of collaboration is just feeling so very, very sad about this perpetual crisis in the humanities. Looking back in time helps. The humanities have always been in crisis. In fact, the first book that I've seen that has the title The Crisis in the Humanities was published in 1960 by Plum, but actually you could count the Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius, <laughs> written in about 410 as um, an early example of the genre. So cheer up, it's always been a crisis, and maybe the humanities are like a pyrescent species, you know, those plants that germinate um, because of a forest fire. They need the fire in order to germinate. Maybe that's what we are. So that, that's me trying to be cheerful. Uh, maybe it's not a 
totally successful metaphor, but anyway, here we are, the Pyrescent Chase Consortium. And this is a great consortium for me personally because it's crammed with people who are interested in the history of art, historical bibliography, and material culture studies, which are the three kind of major areas that interest me. And as soon as it came into being, I um, got in touch with all of my uh, friends across our Bush tele Telegraph network in, um, in Chase, and we bid to the AHRC for some money to put on a program for Chase students, which is called Material Witness. Now, you might be thinking, what is it? So far, I haven't really said that much about digital. And here, I'm going to try to uh, show the connection. In my field, um, uh, which is really especially concerned with uh, very, very rare and priceless works of art, especially manuscripts, since I started out as a graduate student in 1995, there's been a huge amount of digitization. It's wonderful. It's hugely transformative. Uh, anybody now can leaf through manuscripts online that um, when I was starting out, really nobody was allowed to see. But there has been there are some unintended consequences of this, I think. One of them is that as material has become more accessible online, libraries have become less willing to let people handle things in reading rooms. When I was an MA student, I got to look at one of the icons of Anglo-Saxon book illumination for a weekly essay, the Tiberius Psalter. To say that would never happen now is, um, well, I was going to say it's an understatement. No, it's just a literal statement. It just would never happen now. So I was very lucky. And I learned a lot from being able to handle those books. It's given me the ability to look at digital images of manuscripts and make sense of them in a way that somebody who hasn't looked at hundreds of manuscripts probably can't. So one of my motivations for this is to think about how we negotiate that difference in, that's come about so, so quickly, really within the past, well, I'm older than I make out, probably 15 years. I was going to say the past five or six years. No, no, actually, <laughs> really, it's longer than that. But, um, uh, and, and so the driving force of this program is not just to get out and look at things together, and I've got plenty of pictures. I'll just whiz through some. There's our, um, uh, our logo, our early logo for the project. There's lots of pictures of people doing things together. Well, th there they are having a party. I'm not sure. Um, we went to the British Library. We looked at manuscripts, and we talked to their imaging scientist who is responsible for, um, for digitizing things and also analyzing uh, images. Um, in, uh, she has a PhD in astrophysics from Imperial, and so she uses the skills that she learned looking at the distant galaxies to look at medieval illuminated manuscripts, which I count as awesome. So um, she is great. We then went to Goldsmiths and looked at their textile collection. We um, ha had some study days where we considered, where we stepped back and l thought about the kind of big methodological themes that we were raising. So for example, about the material turn. Um, we have a lot of pictures of people standing around and looking very carefully at physical objects. Um, but we also talked about digitizing and what is lost and what is gained in the translation from a physical artifact to a digital one. And it was um, ha full of kind of unexpected outcomes. Um, of the, and in a way, I don't want to be too Pollyanna-ish, but it's a real win-win situation that we're in uh, right now. Um, because people can find things that they couldn't find before. I mean, that's one of the great benefits. I mean, if you don't know that a book is in the library to look at, you won't go and look at it. And that is one of the great wins, I think, of this mass digitization era. I'm just going to go past um, to uh, uh, this slide of a massive tape measure. Um, one of the things, though, that we lose in the digital is a sense of scale. And so we had a whole day, and it was actually a theme that ran through the program, thinking about the size of things. And we often think, I think, there's often a kind of false uh, dilemma, I guess, that's posed um, that, uh, about digitization, that there's the virtual and then there's the real. But of course, we never, ever encounter a digital artifact without the help of a physical, real one. And um, we explored that theme partly um, by going and measuring things and talking about what you can learn from a real thing that you can't learn from a digital surrogate but also um, from having a study day where we, um, we took um, Walter Benjamin's um, 
uh, iconic essay, uh, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, and uh, explored how that cashed out in the age of digital reproduction. And the, 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 the sweet trick of that day was that we had artists as well as uh, humanity scholars talking about making works of art that were born digital. And the physical uh, embodiment of those digital works of art and how important that was to them. And in fact, we had uh, live from Toronto a Skype link from uh, a young video artist who talked about her work live and then presented it to the group. So that was one of the kind of really exciting things about this program, was coming together with scholars from all across the humanities but within this collaborative network to explore um, the status of witnessing physical objects in the digital era. And um, out of this um, process, oh, and we did some drawing too, and actually I'm going to leave that slide because this um, gives rise to my next point. One of the things about coming together in this kind of experimental way um, uh, with, uh, with people to explore um, works of art and other types of objects is um, that you uh, have ideas, uh, totally fresh ideas. And one of the things that came out of this for me was partly just seeing that it, it was really interesting and valuable for the students. It wasn't, I mean, obviously I'd constructed it for my own personal gratification, but they got something out of it too. Um, and one, and things that I hadn't predicted. They enjoyed, for example, the making component. I mm -hmm. thought when I was putting the program together that it's all well and good for art historians to sit around criticizing works of art. Very often I think when I hear people talk about the failure of an artist to capture a foreshortened limb or something, what I often think is, okay, here you go, do it yourself. And so that's what we did. Here we are all, um, all our drawing. And that, out of that drawing workshop, I got the idea of a, of a new uh, doctoral program, um, which we've now bid for money for, called Material World. And that idea is that, in th that we take this insight into the value of making for humanity scholars, and then we try to spread it not just within the humanities, but to other uh, areas of the university's activities as well. So this is a collaboration between scientists, uh, social scientists, and humanists. And that was one of the kind of things that I really wanted to underscore about the idea of collaborative humanities, is that we need not just to collaborate amongst ourselves, literary scholars boldly collaborating with art historians, for example, but we need to get on our bikes and ride across campus and go and see what people are doing in applied optics. We need to find out how chemists work. How do they formulate questions? I discovered it's very different than the way we do, but mm -hmm. excitingly so. And I think really those quite distant collaborations may be more energizing, as well as giving us access to the really massive green rectangle on the AHRC versus everybody else diagram. So you can be cynical about it, but you can also, I think, uh, see that there are some real values, and a uh, real value to that, more making. We also did some digital things. Oh, I wanted to ask you, what's the hashtag? I've been using knowledge machines. You see, we had hashtags for things. And, um, and that gave rise to a lot of online discourse. And so did our blog. And one of the things I found obsessively interesting as uh, the project went on last year was watching this map. So this is where everything took place, you know, really in England. We didn't go to Scotland or Wales or France or anything. But as the project rolled on and the students blogged about it, it spread across the world. I mean, we're still, it was like a bit, bit like one of those, um, you know, Eurovision Song Contests. Like, we, we really needed um, China. <laughs> we really needed some of the other uh, African nations or so forth. But I think that is partly the power of things like this, that what is local can become global uh, very uh, rapidly by means of digital media. And so my dream, if I have a bold dream, is to try to turn material witness into some kind of global movement. No, I'm kidding, actually. I'm not kidding, but I sort of am. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, end my talk by talking about this, um, well, I'm not going to talk more about the bucket, but I am going to talk a little bit more about what we might mean by collaborating. And I think here, like most medievalists, I like pointing out the etymology to words. The middle of collaborate is about labor. 
uh, laborare to work. It's about working together, using all the different tools that we have in order not just to achieve common predetermined goals, but to find a spark to come up with new questions and goals, ones that we didn't anticipate at the beginning of the project that we uh, started on. And I think I've run out of time, so instead of making more speeches, I'll just stop. Is that okay? <laughs>